Today's presentation is a, an, aquat, an introduction to aquatic insects, basic taxonomy, ecology, and their use in assessing freshwater environments. Our presenter today is Dan Pickard. Dan is an aquatic invertebrate taxonomist with the Aquatic Bioassessment Laboratory. That laboratory is located at Chico State University. He's broadly trained in North American freshwater invertebrate identification and has at least 28 years of experience. If we count all of his fly fishing years and hooking worms and <laughs> chasing after bugs, it's a lifetime of enjoyment in the water, playing with bugs and getting paid for it too. Yeah, he's a really good scientist, really good person, and I'm so happy that he is giving his time to us today. And we're also going to be posting in the uh, chat a web link if you want to join us for more presentations like this, as well as an in-person workshop that we're hoping to host this fall at Chico State University, then uh, please sign up. We'll get that posted in a little bit. And uh, at the end of the webinar, we'll make that announcement again. Uh, thank you for, for joining us and thank you, Dan. Uh, take it away. Thank you, Eric. Um... So as Eric mentioned, this is also uh, part of SAFIC, which is the Southwestern Association of Freshwater Invertebrate Taxonomists. Um, and uh, we're a society that promotes taxonomy of aquatic insects and its, and its use uh, in the state. Um, and I am a member of that organization, just like Eric is. Um, so, in conjunction with SAFIT and um, Eric's team there, that's what we're doing this presentation for. So um, this is gonna be a very informal presentation. Um, if you have any questions at all, um, go ahead and raise your hand in the in the chat up here. Um, and if I don't see it, hopefully Eric will see it and um, we can just, you know, say, okay, what's your question? And we can answer questions. So. Again, very informal, um, and uh, I hope it goes well. Uh, I'm really excited to um, share with you all the all the cool critters that I've seen over my lifetime working with these with these animals. So, um, aquatic insects and their use in bioassessment. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the the insects themselves. Um, Many very common insects have an aquatic life stage. And you can see here, everyone knows what a dragonfly looks like, right? That's this image down here on the bottom. A lot of people probably don't know that the larvae are aquatic. They live in the aquatic environment. And this is actually a live shot of, uh, of a dragonfly. So this stage of, of its life, the aquatic stage of, it li of its life, usually accounts for the majority of its life cycle anywhere between 50 to 95%, but most of them, it's more like 90 to 95%. Um, some of these can live up to two years in the aquatic environment before they become an adult and, and have a terrestrial stage. They are very successful in the aquatic environment. They've exploited every possible niche, rivers, streams, lakes, um, and as we're probably all aware, mosquitoes can breed in just a couple inches of water, uh, and they can complete their, complete their life cycle in sometimes a week, very, very quickly. So that's why, you know, you always hear uh, public announcements saying, let's, you know, make sure you don't have any standing water on your property. Dump out that water because <coughs> mosquitoes can breed um, really quickly in, in that type of water. There are 11 orders, over 80 families, hundreds of genera, and, and hundreds of species. So a very, very diverse group of aquatic insects. And this image here is an adult stonefly. It's actually the adult of this larvae right here, Terranarsis. Um, you can see it looks fairly similar. So their use in bioassessment. Um, why do we use aquatic insects in bioassessment? Uh, so bioassessment is using the, the biology 
uh, the, the things that live in a body of water to say something about the quality of that water. And we can use them because, A, they spend the majority of their lives in that aquatic environment, and they are a very diverse and adaptable group of organisms. So um, they will uh, respond to any sort of um, pollution event in in a water body, uh, just in their ability to survive. So these critters can be classified in different ways. Um, Basically, they are classified on how they feed. Um, that's called functional feeding groups. How and where they live. So if they live in this ripple right here, or if they live in a pool back behind this or whatever, and, and how they actually relate to their environment. Do they cling onto things? Are they swimmers? That sort of thing. And then lastly, in their tolerance to pollution. And I have pollution in quotes here because we're not talking about just chemicals. Pollution can be things like sediment, say after a fire and, the, and uh, you know, all the sediment from the surrounding landscape has, has washed down into the, into the stream and filled the interstitial spaces so these craters don't have a place to live. So tolerance to pollution in general. And again, if anyone has questions, raise your hand. Uh, this is, this is, uh, we want this to be interactive if, if possible, if you guys want to. So um, so they can be classified in those different ways. And I'm going to kind of go through each of these uh, different ways. Um, functional feeding groups. They're split into basically four different functional feeding groups. Shredders, collectors, uh, scrapers or grazers, and predators. Um, shredders are organisms that uh, take coarse particulate organic matter. So we're talking leaves, uh, things like that, that have fallen from the terrestrial environment into the stream, and they break them up and feed on, on these things. Uh, collectors, collectors can be either um, gatherers uh, or filterers, and they look at particulate organic matter, well, that's what they feed on is particular, particulate organic matter, uh, which is the, the very, very fine particles um, that, that are in the water column or, or in the benthos in the bottom of the streams and rivers. Um, scrapers or grazers, so they will uh, scrape diatoms and algae off of rocks and other surfaces in the stream. Uh, and then predators, of course, eat other critters. So we got we have a couple pictures here. Uh, these are caddisflies on top of this rock here, and they are actually scraping the algae off the surface of this rock. This here is a collector filterer. Uh, it's the net of a caddisfly. He spins this net in. Uh, in the stream flow and anything that catches on this net, he'll come and feed off of it. This is an example of a of a predator. Uh, this is a node connected. Um, I've put an arrow here to show the piercing sucking mouth part um, that these guys employ. You often find this particular group in your swimming pool sometimes if if uh, if you have a swimming pool. They they can fly and they will come to your pool often. Uh, OK, so habit and habitat, how and where they live. So clingers will live in riffles, sprawlers in riffles. Uh, swimmers can be in any habitat because uh, they're very multile. They'll they'll move around an awful lot. Uh, burrowers, they like to burrow down in the mud, uh, so they're usually in pools. Skaters. Think of uh, uh, water striders, if you want to think of skaters. Um, those will usually be in slower water habitats, like a pool. Uh, and then climbers will be on vegetation, or uh, usually vegetation that's growing in the, in the water. Tolerance to pollution. 
So, um, like I said earlier, they've incorporated their response to pollution uh, in their ability to survive. So everything that's happening in this watershed um, over the past year, sometimes up to two years, depending on the the, the critter that we're looking at, uh, they're integrating everything that's happening in that watershed and their ability to survive. And they can be categorized, excuse me, as tolerant or intolerant on a scale of 10 to 0. So if it's a 10, it's a very tolerant organism, which means it can handle, uh, you know, influxes of pollution. And that's what this critter down at the bottom is. Uh, this is the family, the Diptera family Tabanidae, which is a horse fly or deer fly. Uh, and if anyone's ever been bitten by an adult horse fly or deer fly, you know they're nasty critters. Um, the one on top, this is Epiorus. It's a heptogeneid mayfly, um, and it is very intolerant to pollution. So based on these population dynamics, based on population dynamics and things like the functional feeding groups, uh, we can look at biological metrics. So uh, they will describe what the population is doing, um, or they will describe what sorts of functional feeding groups or whatever is happening. Um, yeah, we have yeah. a hand up. Uh, oh, Patrick. Hi. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could go back to the pollution or tolerance slide. Yep, that one. Um, yeah. So, so you mentioned previously, you know, <clears throat> pollution can mean a lot of different things from sediment, heavy metals, or, you know, what whatever it may be. Um, and I am wondering if there's certain invert or benthic macroinvertebrates that are more sensitive to certain pollution types, you know, whether it's sediment or, you know, um, heavy metals or salinity or yes, things of yes. that nature. Yes, absolutely. Um, and it depends on uh, where in the stream they live and how they live. For instance, um, things like uh, the, the clingers and sprawlers that live in the riffles. Um, if you have a huge pulse of sediment coming into your stream, um, it's going to fill that fine sediment, it's going to fill those interstitial spaces in between the, the cobbles uh, and the smaller gravel where these things live, right? So basically, it would be like, uh, you know, your house being uh, inundated by a mudslide. So yes, um, a lot of these individual critters respond um, more to different types of pollution. Um, for instance, like this mayfly here, uh, a lot of the mayflies especially um, have been known to be uh, sensitive to heavy metals. Um, so yes, absolutely. Any follow up okay. questions? Um Yes, thank you. That, that was super um, helpful. And so building off of that, based on the community composition, can you make conclusions about what types of pollution um, might be the most, I guess, impactful to a certain or like, you know, I, I for example, I don't have a lot of where I might expect to have a lot of mayfly larvae in this system and I don't. Can I potentially draw or would that lead me to investigate heavy metal concentrations? Um, I mean, there's other things that can knock them out. They're, they're sensitive to all sorts of stuff, right? Uh, it's both habitat and uh, what's in the water column too. So um, you kind of have to do lines of evidence sort of thing. So um, these critters can, on the base of it, they can tell you, oh yeah, there's a big problem here, right? But then you have to dive into, okay, what am I missing in, that, in this taxa list? Uh, of stuff. Um, and I, we can kind of answer this as as I go on to my next uh, my next slide here. Um, this one here. So one of the things we can calculate um, with these critters is called the CSCI, which is the California Stream Condition Index. Um, and 
it looks at a number of different metrics that we were talking about. So here's the example of the metrics that it uses in, in its calculation. Uh, and then it also looks at the tax list, what we think we should have in a site versus what you actually get when you go out and sample the site, right? And it combines those two things into a score. The closer it is to one, um, the closer you are to, to it being the population it should be, right? So not disturbed. Uh, so the things that, that are used in that are um, number of species. Uh, so that's, you know, number of species is uh, the more different things you have at a site, the better it is, basically. Um, number of shredders, so that one type of organism. Um, percent clingers, percent coleoptera, or percent beetles. EPT, percent EPT, mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies. So let me back up here a second. Um, a good rule of thumb, if you have lots of mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies in your site, it's usually pretty good. And there are some exceptions to that, but that's a good rule of thumb. So percent EPT, the more of those there is, the better the site is. And then percent intolerant organisms like that Epiorus mayfly or like this stonefly right here. This is a stonefly squalor and the family perloded it. Um, so that's what the CSCI metrics, uh, those are the metrics to used in the CSCI calculation. Um, but there are tons more metrics than just what's used uh, in the CSCI calculation. Um, hundreds of different things we can we can use to describe these uh, these communities of organisms. So that's kind of their use in bioassessment. Um, the next part of this talk, we're going to actually kind of start talking about the insects themselves and how you would go about differentiating them uh, by order. Um, so the first kind of set of slides here I have uh, is what the larvae of these critters look like versus the adults. So dragonflies, and this is both these specimens here on the left are live specimens. Um, this is what the dragonfly uh, larvae looks like, and of course that's what the adult looks like. The damselflies, the adults are the small, smaller blue ones that that don't fly as well. Um, those are dam supplies, and this is this is a larvae here uh, as well. Um, mayflies, larvae on the left, again, adult on the right. The adults, they hold their wings upright over their back. Uh, stoneflies, plecoptera, plecoptera means folded wings, so they these guys actually fold their wings as adults back over the abdomen, so they don't they don't hold them up like the mayflies do. True bugs, um, the hemipteran, and both of these are actually adults. Uh, a lot of these guys have both the larvae and adults as uh, as aquatic stages. Caddisflies or case flies, um, and we'll go into the specifics of all this stuff too. So, uh, but the adult looks a lot like a moth. Uh, people have probably seen tons of adult caddisflies before and they think they're just moths. Uh, Megaloptera, Dobson flies, Helgramites, and that's what the adult looks like. We do have one aquatic moth. Um, not many, but just one. Uh, beetles, uh, often the, the larvae and the adults are aquatic. Um, and then you have true flies as well. So two wings, diptera, two true flies. So the next part of this, um, we're going to go order by order and and look at the distinguishing characteristics for each order. Um, excuse me. And show you some more slides for that. But first, uh, let me talk about uh, their life stages. So aquatic insects in general can be split into two different types. 
either hemimetabolous or holometabolous. Holometabolous means complete metamorphosis. The biggest difference between these two is holometabolous insects have a pupil stage, just like a butterfly. Caterpillar will pupate the adult butterfly will emerge out of that puparium. A lot of aquatic insects have a pupil stage. Uh, the ones that don't, the hemimetabolous insects, uh, basically when they want to become an adult, they will just crawl out on rocks or vegetation, um, break out of that last larval shell, unfurl their wings and fly away. Um, most often that adult stage only lasts a few days. Uh, and that's why we say 95 to 99 percent of their life is spent as a lark. The adults basically they mate, lay their eggs and die. Uh, the one group that is kind of the exception to that are the dragonflies and damselflies. They actually feed actively as adults. OK, so we're going to start with our first family. Or I'm sorry, first order, excuse me. Um, if I'm going too fast, please just uh, you know, raise your hand, say, oh, 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 can you say that part again? Um, it's a little bit easier when you're face to face with people, you can kind of get their reactions. So uh, just let me know if I'm going a little bit too fast. So our first group are the Ephemeroptera, scientific name for mayflies. Mayflies is the common name. Um, they are the E in the EPT that we were talking about earlier. Um, in general, and of course there's always exceptions to every rule, right? But in general, um, mayflies have three circe or tails. You can see them on this critter here, coming off the end of the body or the abdomen. Um, gills, so I'll take one step back here. Um, usually the way we differentiate these things is on how they feed and how they breathe. So these things are animals, right? They need to breathe air just like we do. Um, so mayflies in general will have three tails, and everyone can see my pointer, I hope, um, that come off the end of the abdomen. And gills, so again, uh, we categorize these things on how they, how they feed and how they breathe. Uh, gills is one of the ways most of these insects breathe. Um, sometimes they just breathe through, get oxygen through their body. Um, and we'll see some other examples of, of different ways that they, that they breathe too. But gills is one of the big ones. So gills in mayflies are on the abdomen, and they're either going to be dorsal, which means on the top of the critter, or they're going to be lateral, which means coming off the side. Um, they're usually plate-like, um, so they're usually plate-like. Uh, on the end of the leg, the tarsi has one claw, so the end it'll just be one point at the end of the leg. Um, they have one obvious pair of wing pads. Sometimes there's a second one, but usually it's just this one pair of obvious wing pads. Most of these guys are omnivores or herbivores. Um, can only think of one mayfly that's a predatory mayfly. Um, usually they, they eat algae and stuff like that. Um, so I'm going to go through a series of photos now and kind of point out these, these different uh, characteristics in these different photos. So this is another mayfly. Um, if you look real close, you can see a third... <laughs> A third Circe on there, but it has three Circe. Gills are on the abdomen. They're lateral and they're plate like. One obvious pair of wing pads. So in this critter, um, he's about ready to become an adult. These wing pads are very large. You can actually see the venation of the wings inside these wing pads. Same with this guy here. See how dark these wing pads are? Um, both of these critters are probably 
uh, if they weren't collected, they probably would be coming off in the next couple of days to become an adult. This guy again, uh, three Circe. The gills on this guy are these operculate or book-like gills, but they are on the abdomen, and these ones are dorsal. Next slide. More mayflies. So this is actually a live specimen. You can see the gills right here on this critter. They're on the abdomen and they're dorsal. Um, and this is kind of a compound gill. It's got a plate on top and then it's got on the bottom. There's fibrils that will do this sort of thing. Um, and that's because it's trying to increase the, the surface area. Uh, of, of water going across the gill to maximize the oxygen uptake from that. Um, and this critter here is called Drunella dodzi. Um, this pad is on the bottom side of it as a pad of hairs that will help it suck down onto the rock. So these live in very fast flowing parts of the stream, the ripples, um, and that pad of hairs helps it suck down onto the rock in those environments. Uh, that's more just to show you a cool mayfly than, than anything else. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Our next group that we want to talk about are the odinates. So these are the dragonflies and damselflies. Um, the one characteristic that all these things have in common is called, it's a mouth part called labium. And so everyone can see my my picture here, right, Eric? Right? See what I'm yes. doing here? Yes. So they have this mask light labium that they hold kind of almost looks like a bottom lip, right? But they hold it here and they can shoot that thing out twice the length of the head and grab the prey and bring it back in. Um, all odinates have this, this labium. Um, the gills on dragonflies are internal inside the abdomen so it actually sucks water into the abdomen and shoots it back out um the gills on damselflies are external and i have a couple of pictures that can show you that all dragonflies are predators so both as larvae and as adults that is why it's great to have dragonflies around especially well for both larvae and adults but the adults are voracious feeders on things like mosquitoes and midges and other nasty bugs that are flying around. So it's great to have dragonflies around. Um, here is that mask-like labium that I was talking about. And this is, we pulled this out away from the head. So this is extended twice the length of the head. And here are the jaws on the end of that, of that dragonfly. Um, some of these things are big enough to, to actually uh, catch small fish and eat them. Um, there's there's YouTube videos out there of dragonflies eating fish and other things. They're really pretty cool. If you're if you're really interested in this stuff, look it up sometime. It's it's pretty amazing. Um, some of these labiums are kind of spoon shaped, like this one. Uh, this is Cordula dat Cordula gaster dorsalis. It's very common in uh, higher elevation streams that are that are nice and clean. Um, some of these dragonflies, this labium is flattened, like this one right here. And instead of the, the jaws being spoon-like and going like this, they're just on the end, they do this. And you can see those kind of jaws on the end of this critter. Um, so dragonflies, again, the, the gills are internal in these abdomens, and these are just two different families of dragonflies. On this guy, you can see here are the wing pads of this dragonfly. Look at how big they are. Um, so again, this one was gonna, probably going to come off real soon as an adult. Uh, the damselflies, their gills are on the end of the abdomen, and there's, there's three of them. Um, and this particular critter is this is a live shot it's a live specimen you can see its gills are kind of held like this right so maximizing again the surface area um 
to uptake oxygen. Okay, we can go on to our next group. Plecoptera, stoneflies. Um, and anyone who's out there that's a fly fisherman are going to be very familiar with mayflies and stoneflies and caddisflies. Um, those are the things we like to use to, to fish with. But stoneflies in general, well, actually, all sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, <clears throat> all stoneflies have two Circe, so mayflies have three, stoneflies have two. Um, two Circe, you can see the two here, the two on this critter here. Um, but they also, on the end of their tarsi, they have two claws. And you can actually see on this critter here, the two claws. So two tails, two claws for stoneflies. Gills, if they have them, not all stoneflies have gills, but if they have gills, they're going to be on the thorax where the legs come out. And they're going to be either plumas, like you can see them here. It looks like a pom-pom underneath this guy. Um, or they're just going to be kind of finger-like or single. Some of these will actually have gills on the very, very end of the abdomen, but that's not real, real common. And <clears throat> stoneflies have two pairs of wing pads that are obvious. You can see the, the two different wing pads here on this critter. So I'm going to show you some more pictures of stoneflies. This is the underneath side of that big brown one that I just showed you. This is Terranarsis californica. Um, you can see the gills are here where the legs are on the thorax. And they are ventral, so they're on the bottom of the critter. They're not on the top of the critter, they're on the bottom of the critter. And you can see they look like big pom-poms. <laughs> Stoneflies again, two Circe. The gills on this guy are just little finger-like ones, kind of coming off the thorax right here. You can barely see them. Um, but two tails on the end of these, these legs, you're going to have two claws as well. This guy doesn't have any external gills. He just simply breathes through, the, through his skin, basically. This, this is an example of what uh, the shucks look like after they've emerged. So these are all larvae that have crawled out onto this log. Um, and the, their last larval skin is here attached to the log still. They've split this, this skin open and the adults have flown away. Oops, I didn't mean to do that, sorry. Um, and the adults have flown away and it leaves the husk behind. So people probably have seen these husks in um, on vegetation, or uh, they're actually very common under bridges too. They they like that. Um, but any sort of vegetation sticking out of the water, you'll see these these cast skins of mayflies, stoneflies, and dragonflies. So the ones that we've talked about so far are all hemimetabolous insects. They don't have a pupil stage. I'll try to remember when we get to the first hemi uh, holometabolous insect. So the next group are the hemipteran. Uh, the word hemipteran means half wing. Um, the basal part of these wings are sclerotized, which means they're hardened. Um, and then the end part is membranous. So often this will this will look like it when they fold their wings back over, it makes it look kind of like an X on the back of their uh, of their abdomen. Um, they have a piercing sucking mouth part, uh, so they're predators, and these these ones can bite. Um, some of the bellostomatids can be big. In California, they're not as big, but in the southeast, they can be giant. Um, you saw this picture earlier. Uh, this this is a nocorid, the family nocorid, a creeping water bug. If you look at the the forelegs, the front legs, they're called raptorial front legs. So they, like this, they can grab the prey and then they'll stick their beak into the prey and, and 
suck out all the juice. Um, this one over here, this is a live specimen. Um, and what you're seeing here is uh, the highlighted areas here along the organism is caused by a set of hydrofuge hairs, which means hydrofuge means water repelling hairs. So uh, it repels water and it holds uh, a layer of air in between the water and its uh, its body. So that layer of air acts as a physical lung for oxygen to diffuse in and carbon dioxide to diffuse out. Again, another way that these things um, have figured out how to breathe. So this is our last hemi metabolis group. Everything from here on out are going to be holometabolis, which means they have a pupil stage. Uh, our first group of this are the megaloptera. Um, the first slide, my introductory slide, is a big megaloptera, and it was actually a live specimen. Um, these are the helgramites or fish flies. Um, the abdomen has seven or eight pairs of lateral gills, so gills coming off the side. Um, with one pair on each segment. So there won't be multiple lateral things coming off, one per segment. And you can see it, you'll see that in uh, some of the pictures I have here in a minute. The last segment, segment nine, um, is either going to have two pseudopods with claws, or it's going to be one single filament. And I'll show you, show you the difference between those two here in a second. Uh, these, again, are predators. Um, so here's the family Corydalidae. Here are the mandibles of this guy here, and you can tell why this thing's a predator. Um, these are big. The larvae can be like that. Uh, and these are very long-lived aquatic organisms. They usually spend at least two years uh, living in the water uh, before they become, uh, before they pupate and become an adult. Um, and the other family is Cialidae, but you can see the lateral filament, lateral gill filaments on each abdominal segment here. And there's here as well, but I'll show you a little bit better picture. So the family Corydalidae, um, the, the paired uh, anal prolegs with the hooks. So two versus a single filament in the Cialidae. Um, and these are also uh, a pretty sensitive species. Um, they're not part of our EPTs, but it's again one of the ones that is, is are are sensitive or intolerant. Okay, our next group are the Lepidoptera. So we have one. Um, aquatic moth that is commonly found in rivers and streams. Uh, it's the genus Petrophila, um, but it still has the same characteristics of other Lepidoptera. So if you've seen a caterpillar before, um, you know, it has its its regular legs, but it has a series of fresh, fleshy prolegs, and they're tipped with these, a circle of tiny little hooks called crochets. So one, so all of all of these Lepidoptera have that, um, and we have this one common Petrophila. Um, some live with aquatic plants. The ones in streams are uh, are scrapers. They scrape algae. So let's show you a picture of Petrophila. Here's Petrophila. These are the circlets that we were talking about. Uh, which are very common on caterpillars too. Um, head end, uh, this is a scraper, but again, um, you know, how does this thing break? Well, this thing, it uptakes oxygen with all these gills all along the, the edge of the body here. Um, 
These guys form a case on rocks. Oops, case on rocks. Um, this is a living adult inside the the, the case that it's made. Um, and here are the cases on the rock. So, you know, you probably think that that's just some algae snot on the rock or something like that. No, it's not. If you actually pull this apart, you'll see the, the living larvae inside these. Um, these are very common in, especially in our Sierra Foothills streams. Um, uh, here in Chico, we have a number of streams kind of coming out of the out of the Sierras, and they're they're in all of those. So, um, kind of look for these these things that I don't know look look like just a blob of algae or something, and try to pull one up and see if you can see a crater in there. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, our next group, the Trichoptera. So this is the T in the EPT. Um, the common name for a Trichoptera are caddisflies. Um, and this is one of my favorite groups just because the diversity of these critters is amazing. Um, it's really hard especially for beginners to differentiate um, trichoptera, lar trichoptera larva versus beetle larvae, uh, especially if you don't have the case to go with it. Um, for trichoptera, there's going to be a pair of anal prolegs, just kind of like there was with that corydalid, and there's going to be claws on the end of that, those prolegs. You can see the, that proleg right here on this particular guy. And depending on how it lives, whether it's a free living caddisfly, a retreat maker like this guy, or one that actually lives inside a case. Um, oh, someone too bad. The slides weren't advancing for them. Sorry about that. Um, so depending on if they live in a case, if they're free liver or free living caddis fly, uh, those anal prolegs with the claws are going to be big and long and extended, or they're going to be really stubby and basically just hold on to the inside of this case. Uh, the thorax, which is where the legs are, um, is going to have different levels of sclerotization. Either one, two, or three segments will be sclerotized. The abdomen is going to be membranous, and the gills are often going to be finger-like, and they're going to be on the abdomen. Most of these guys build a case. Here's a case of this guy. Here's the case for this guy. Um, but some make silk retreats, and some are free living. And they also have various feeding behaviors. So we're going to kind of go through some of the uh, examples of this. So our guy on the left here, he's a free living caddisfly. You can see those those big anal hooks right here, um, and he's a predator. So look at that big mandible right there. The ones that are free living are all predators. They're all predatory, uh, and they need those big claws to move around in the rocks and everything, hunting for prey. Uh, the one here on our right, he's just a shredder. Um, he'll take He'll take individual uh, twigs like this guy and he'll cut them up and he'll glue them together. All caddisflies have silk glands like butterflies do, and they will glue um, stones or pieces of vegetation or whatnot together to, to build these houses that they live in. So uh, next slide here. Uh, this is the family Glossus somatidae. They're called saddle case ma makers because they they have this smaller set of stones underneath that um, that they put together. It looks like a saddle. It's like the underside of a saddle. Uh, these guys are scrapers. Um, and you'll see them here again in our next slide. Uh, this is a big one. 
these these guys can be this big. Oh, I see someone's Patrick. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I was just wondering what the if there's a different oxygen uptake strategy for caddis flies that build the casing. They also have gills. Um, almost all of these guys will have gills, or it's subcutaneous, which means right through the uh, through the body. Some of these critters that have these bigger cases, they can actually undulate inside the case uh, to get more water flow coming through. Um, but a lot of these guys are found in riffle areas anyways, where the okay. where um, you know the oxygen concentration is higher because it's it's more um, uh, it's more agitated. The water's more agitated, so there's more oxygen in, in those areas. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, so this is a limnophilid. Uh, he's a big guy. Uh, you can see the little gill right here, uh, Patrick, on this guy. Um, and then we saw this slide before, but this is an example of two different types of uh, caddis flies. This is the glossosomatids right here. That's what they look like from the top. Um, and this is a retreat for a hydrocycid. Uh, and I think I have a couple more pictures of those retreats. Yes. So <clears throat> here's more of those silk uh, retreats with the nets spun out in the current. Uh, and often the size of the, the mesh that they make, um, it can tell you what genus it is. Again, these things are just, they're pretty cool. Um, some more caddis flies. The one on the right, this is a high, this is a family Hydroptilidae. These things are teeny, teeny, tiny. They're little, little, little guys. Um, so this, uh, these guys actually, this particular one right here, these are liverworts that it's cut into these little circles that it's glued into its into its uh into its case um here's a live shot here loss of somatids and here's mayflies right next to each other eating the same thing they're scraping algae off these rocks there's a mayfly and a caddisfly right next to each other and this is another one of our bigger caddisflies these are mostly found in in lakes or in backwaters of streams um and one thing that people have done with these bigger caddis flies, um, you know, they can be about this big or so. Um, the the final instar before it pupates, they will take it out of its case that it's made and put it in an aquarium uh, filled with precious gemstones, right? Either flecks of gold or um, you know, small little other precious gemstones and the caddis fly will actually take those stones and make the case out of those out of those stones once it pupates and flies off you have caddis fly jewelry that's really pretty cool anyways i digress a little bit a couple more cases um again just the and often you can look at the case and just by looking at the case you know what caddis fly it is. Uh, they're that distinctive. Brachycentris here, uh, fishermen, I'm sure, uh, know this guy. Um, and this is another one that fill in here. All right. Uh, so when these guys are going to uh, become an adult, first they need to pupate. So they'll pupate in that uh, in that case, in that last, or it, the pupae will pupate inside its case in a puparium. Uh, that pupae will crawl, crawl out from the water onto a hard surface like these rocks here, um, pop out of that pupal skin and um, and become an adult. One of my next groups here are the Coleoptera. Um, everyone knows what a beetle looks like. This is an adult beetle. The aquatic adult beetles look 
very similar to terrestrial adult beetles. Um, the larvae of aquatic coleoptera, um, the body may be completely sclerotized, which means completely hardened. If it is completely sclerotized, it's a beetle. Uh, but not all beetles have a completely sclerotized abdomen. Often they're uh, they're unsclerotized. So the larvae for these critters, they don't have anal prolegs like Trichoptera, but they may have some sort of claw structure back there. But it's not on the end of a proleg. Uh, the adults are characteristic for this uh, first pair of wings or elytra that are hardened. Um, the second pair of wings is underneath this, and they can actually uh, open these elytra up and unfurl those bottom wings. And, and these guys are known to fly. Uh, almost all aquatic beetles can fly. Um, and these also have various types of feeding behaviors from uh, scrapers to predators. So we have an adult beetle on the left and a larvae on the right. The larvae here is completely sclerotized. This is a riffle beetle, the family Elmidae. Um, this guy here is a predaceous diving beetle. The way it breathes air is it will come up to the surface of the water or the surface of the water. Um, and it will, it's got, again, a series of high diffused hairs in between the elytra and the body. And it'll get an air bubble that it, uh, takes with it wherever it, it swims, and the oxygen and carbon dioxide will diffuse across that 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 barrier, that air bubble. Again, adult on the left and riffle beetle on the right. Um, so elytra, just like before, and the hard this this one's completely sclerotized. I think we're on to my last group now. Okay, our last group that we're going to go over today are the diptera. Um, the diptera have no sclerotized legs. So everything that we've seen before uh, has three pairs or six total legs that are jointed and sclerotized. You can see them, right? The diptera they don't have jointed sclerotized legs. So if you see a critter and it doesn't have legs, it's a diptera. Uh, the head of these things may be sclerotized and it may be obvious, or it may be completely reduced just to two slender rods and completely internalized into the organism. So they don't have true jointed legs, but they all, not all of them, but a lot of them can have these fleshy prolegs um, with claws on the end of it. And of course, these guys um, have really diverse different types of breathing structures on the tail end of these things, often. Some it's just through the body, some it, it's more elaborate breathing structures on the end of it. Excuse me. Here's couple examples of diptera. Um, so here, the head of this critter, it's out, it's sclerotized, you can see it. Here are those prolegs that I was talking about. They're fleshy, but they've got hooks on the end of it. Our guy on the right, the head is here, but it's sucked back into the thorax. You can barely even see it. Uh, some actually live within algae. Uh, this is Crocodopus nostococola. This is a blue-green algae called nostoc, and it actually lives inside of this of this blue-green algae. <laughs> they do have uh, silk glands as well, and can make sort of these little retreats. They're not; they can't use the stones like uh, Trichoptera because they're so much smaller. Uh, but they can use sand particles and stuff like this. So this is actually a, a retreat uh, of Rio Tarsus. Um, they can often be in huge, huge numbers in, in rivers and streams and in lakes. Um, 
Midges, coronamids are diptera are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. Uh, often they are very tolerant to pollution. Um, here are some cases in the bottom of a lake. This is uh, it's commonly known as a blood midge. They've actually got hemoglobin inside, uh, which helps with oxygen. Um, so they can be uh, they can often be very very numerous in uh streams and rivers that are polluted with whatever sort of pollution is is happening um they are very tolerant organisms um but they're found everywhere so they're they're in really nice streams as well Let's see we may be getting close to the end we only have a couple more slides left um this believe it or not is the tail end of a diptera. Uh, these are the spiracles which it breathes through, and there's some gills on the on the end here that help it breathe. Uh, this is the family Typulidae, also known as crane flies. So the the, the larvae of these things are big. Um, not all crane fly larvae are aquatic, but there are a lot of crane fly larvae that are aquatic. Um, this is my last slide. Um, one of the ways that some of these guys feed is through filtering. So black flies, which black fly adults aren't too bad out here, um, but in other parts of the country and in, especially in other parts of the world, black fly adults are huge pest vectors. So uh, they they can carry some nasty diseases. The adults of these things are biting flies. Um, but the larvae of these guys have a mouth part, a labral fan um, that they'll stick out in the in the current and sift uh, particulate organic matter out of it and feed on those fans. Um, uh, and here is some of them on a rock. So um, that is my last slide. Um, I'd love to take questions from anyone. Uh, I all also want to remind you guys to respond to that. Um, the link about uh, future uh, presentations or uh, we will be having an in. Person workshop here at Chico State uh, where we'll go over these these same sorts of order level differences, but we'll we'll actually look at the stuff under the scope and we'll have examples of all these different uh, orders for people to look at and to try to use these uh, these ways of differentiating them and to see if you can figure out what order is what order. Um, so I guess at this point, Eric, we can go ahead and, and open it up to any questions at all uh, from anyone. That's great. Thank you, Dan. Uh, so if you have questions, you can go ahead and unmute and ask your question of Dan. Okay, you can raise your hand. You can also put them in the chat box and we'll get uh, Dan to respond to your question. We had one comment while you were making a, uh, your presentation and it was regarding the application of pesticides to waters. Uh, that's not part of the section of the water boards that I work in. So I Put into the chat a link to the NPDES section that addresses uh, the aquatic application of pesticides. So you could reach out to them and hopefully they could answer your question uh, speedily. Well, thank you, Dan, uh, and thank you, Safit, for uh, making this aquatic invertebrate workshop happen. Hi. Um, yeah, go this, ahead. This is Koa. I ask a question about um, specimens. Is there a way to um, take photos of the specimens in the field and have that count? Count in Is what way? Uh, well, you know, ordinarily you you have to collect them and preserve them, and 
Um, so say you're doing a survey and say you find something semi rare. Can you do you have to collect it uh, physically or is it can, is it adequate to take high resolution photos? For the ID to still count. Well, uh, if if the photo is. Is good enough that one of us taxonomists can look at it and uh, see the structures that we need to see. So these things are called benthic macroinvertebrates, which means macro means you can see them with the eye. But often um, to really distinguish these things, you need to put them under the microscope to see kind of the finer level mouth part characters and some of the gill characters and things like that. So um, pictures possibly can be used. Um, or yeah, my colleague said if you're a taxonomist or you send those pictures to someone like us, we could probably we, we could probably at least give you a family. Um, we may not be able to give you a, a generic level identification just based on a photo, but um, uh, but as far as counting for what tax is in there, I mean, if if you get an identification from it, sure, you know, you know where the picture was taken. So um, I wouldn't ever try to uh, completely just use images um, because these things are amazingly cryptic um, and often they're in spaces where you wouldn't think they would be. So, uh, you know, under under rocks, you know, in some caterpillars will actually make their make their case out of a single twig. So you think it's just a twig laying in the bottom of the stream, uh, but it's actually a caterpillar. So I don't know if that long winded answer answers your question or not, but. Uh, yeah, yeah, roughly. Um, so there isn't necessarily a accepted protocol for using photos in lieu of preserved specimens, but no. It could be adequate if you had high resolution photos of the. Yeah, but again, it's good. You're not you're definitely not going to get photos of your whole community. So, I mean, if you're just looking for specific organisms, you know, if you're just looking for this one stonefly that you want to document that's in there and you've got a picture of it, yeah, that's fine. But, um, you know, if you're going to try to categorize your whole community, uh, you definitely want. Uh, you want to you want to see it all. You, you, it, you're not going to get enough images. I mean, we're talking. Oh, you know, 80, 90 genera. In some of these better streams. Microscope. Yeah. yeah, a picture through a microscope would work. Yeah. And we had a, another question that came up in the yeah. chat. Yeah, I see. Uh, how do you see e environmental DNA, eDNA impacting the freshwater taxonomy world? Um, so uh, I also work with the State Water Resources and Control Board Swamps program, and they are doing some uh, preliminary work with eDNA stuff. Um, and some of that preliminary work is it, it's they're having more luck with the algae analysis than they are with um with benthic benthic macroinvertebrates uh the problem is that the the dna libraries are so insufficient for this stuff um that they're not able to really capture what they want um so it's not going to replace uh, traditional morphological taxonomy uh, anytime soon. Um, yeah, we did host a webinar on eDNA for bioassessments earlier this month. I put a link to the video in the chat. There you go. Okay. We have another question from Patrick. Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. This was great. Um, I'm you brought up the CSCI. I'm I'm wondering if there is or um, is in development something similar for um, aquatic or benthic macroinvertebrates in lakes. Um, 
No. Um, Lakes is a water body that um, we, well, we've done some stuff on um, <clears throat> on temporary pools. We've done some stuff on, uh, are you familiar with Squirp at all, Patrick? Yeah. So <clears throat> our lab did some work with Squirp on, um, on, uh, they're not lakes, they were more ponds than they were lakes. Um, and I can't remember if they came up with some sort of temporary, uh, uh, it, it wouldn't be a, a CSCI, it wouldn't be that advanced. It would be something more basic. Um, most, most stuff done on lakes is about, uh, you know, harmful algal blooms and whether or not the fish are safe to eat. <laughs> That's what most of the work on, on lakes mm -hmm. has done so far. Um, it's, it's a water body that, that swamp hasn't really done much in the way of benthic macroinvertebrates for. Um, there might be something nationally out there uh, through the EPA that, that gives you a better idea, um, but we don't have anything specific in California for lakes yet for benthic macroinvertebrates. Okay. Yeah, I'm just thinking, you know, since they're integrators of pollution that, you know, trying to apply a similar strategy like the CSCI and streams to something to, to lakes as a water body type could be beneficial. But I also understand the challenges. Yeah, Swamp may get around to it eventually. Um, right now, you know, we've yeah, really yeah. got our tools developed really well for weightable streams. Um, and we're also now starting to branch out into non-perennial streams, which huge amount of stream miles in California is non-perennial streams. We have time for a few more questions. Thank you for all the wonderful uh, feedback and questions. Really appreciate your involvement. And yeah, it makes it nice when people are hour. actually when people are actually interacting and it's not just kind of me listening to my own voice. Um, hi. Quickly, I was just wondering, just for context, for some of the listeners may not be as familiar, um, talking about, you know, the photographs versus the taxonomy. Um, and I think, can you refresh me? I think like for a bioassessment, you wind up needing five or 600 individual specimens, and that's why they're taken back and, you know, categorized in the lab under the microscope. Yes, so right? for, uh, for the CSCI calculation, you need a minimum of 500 specimens. Uh, to run that analysis. Uh, typically, what we do is we do a 600 count subsample. Um, <clears throat> so when our crews go out and sample a stream, we do 150 meter reach uh, and we do 11 transects and we take a bug sample at each transect. Uh, we put that together um, and then that comes back to our lab. So our lab here at Chico State does all the, <clears throat> the picking uh, for those BMI samples. Um, we have students that do the the processing, and then um, people like myself and my colleague John here will do the identifications. But yeah, so our protocol, we do a 600 fixed count, uh, and we do 600 just so we know we get at least 500 that'll fit for the CSCI. And then also, I just wanted to give context for the CSCI for these predictive metrics. I think because you're looking at what you're observing versus what's expected and i think right. what's expected is based on if it was like a pristine natural environment is that correct yes that's correct so the way okay. the way the predictive portion of it so the csci is a combination of a multi-metric one and we went through the metrics earlier in the talk uh, but it's the other component is an observed uh over expected so there is a computer model that based on your GPS coordinate where your stream is, it will take characteristics of that stream catchment, uh, elevation, rainfall, type of soil, um, all non-biological things, and it will uh, spit out a set of taxa, um, a list of taxa, bugs that you that should be in that system. 
that's your expected. Uh, and then when we go out and sample, we process that sample and we looked at the observed versus the expected. Uh, and if they're missing a lot of them, then your CSCI score is obviously going to be impacted. Thank you. This is a great talk. For your reference, I added a link to the bioassessment scores map. That's the CSCI scores, right? Yeah. yeah. And that's a decent interactive site. You can kind of, um, you know, there'll be there'll be points on streams all across the state that'll be highlighted and it'll have the CSCI scores and often the ASCII score as well, which is the al the algae the algal um, scoring tool. Uh, so we've also developed, uh, so we have bugs, which is CSCI. We have algae, which the, is the ASCI, but then there's also um, an index of physical habitat. So when we go out to these streams and sample, not only are we collecting bugs and algae, but we're doing in-stream habitat assessment and riparian habitat assessment. So there's uh, the scoring tool for that is called the IPI or the Index of Phys Physical Habitat Integrity. Um, so obviously those are, we kind of look at them as um, different ways of measuring stream health, right? Uh, so the CSEI, the ASCII, and the IPI, um, three different ways of looking uh, it, Kind of think of lines of evidence uh, to see whether or not your site is 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 good or bad. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Safit. Thank you for participating with us, everybody that's still uh, online. Again, if you'd like to follow up and get trained on bioassessment, we have a link in the chat. You can also reach out to myself, Eric Burris, at the Clean Water team. We have a lot of resources available for folks. If you are with a nonprofit organization, a community group that would like to go out there and do bioassessments, I encourage you to uh, get your collection permit and uh, we can work together on training. The Clean Water team also has equipment that it can loan your organization for a, a short term period. All right, guys. Well, uh, go go have yourselves some lunch. <laughs> I'm going to have mine now. Take care. Thanks, everybody.